Hey, we've got it. (laughs) I'm just so grateful, Caitlin, you reached out and I'm so glad that I can be sharing your recovery story today. Uh, Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah. So everyone, Caitlin is from Adelaide, Australia, and she is going to share with us her three-year recovery journey from chronic fatigue syndrome. She also experienced POTS and she's going to tell us how she fully recovered. And Caitlin, I'm just so grateful for you to be here. Yeah, I was so excited. (laughs) So yeah, can you talk a little bit about your onset with CFS? Yeah, so it was something that happened very gradually for me, but I didn't really notice it because I didn't think it was anything serious. I thought it was just being tired or having a lot on my plate. I would say the gradual onset of it was over a longer period of time, probably about five or six years. And then when I actually got to the stage where I just completely went, that was yeah, literally just flat. That was the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019. I was in bed, bedridden really bad. And it was one of those things where there's just small little symptoms that just sort of build up and build up and build up. There's lots of different factors, but yeah, the onset for me was extremely gradual. Yeah. But in 2017, you did have a bout of glandular fever. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, I was in my acting course at the time and you're there Monday to Friday, even some weekends doing a lot of work and I was just feeling really off and really tired and struggling to stay awake. So I went to the doctor and I got tested because my glands are all up as well and they said you have glandular fever, which I think is mono. Yeah, we call it mono. Yeah, mono. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that sucks. I guess I've got glandular fever and I've got to carry on. So um, I had a show at the end of that year. We had just started rehearsals and I still carried on. They had a makeshift bed for me set up and I just kind of go lay down whenever I could, like on the couches, on the floor, wherever. Um, And they had to take out all the kissing scenes because, you know. They had to take out the kissing scenes. No one wants glandular fever. And it's one of those plays where if you kiss one person, that person has to kiss another person who has to kiss another person. So the whole play would have just gone down. So they were like, yeah, we're not doing that. But you're pushing yourself through this whole time. I did. Yeah, I just soldiered on. I just carried on through it and somehow got through that. But I wasn't quite the same afterwards. And then you had another flu. Yeah. So it was a few months on into 2018. And I felt like I was starting to pick up a little bit. And then I came down with this other flu that left me out for about one to two weeks. Some passing random virus that didn't show up in blood tests or anything. And I remember when I got back to classes the following week, I just felt off. Usually I'm someone who's very active and I could do a yoga class, do all of the movements that you have to do for warming up for acting classes. And even those were just exhausting and like achy through my joints. And I was like, what's going on? Am I still unwell? And one of my friends said, well, sometimes some people can get post-virus fatigue after you've had a really bad virus. Maybe you've just got that and it will go away in a couple of weeks. So I thought, yeah, okay, that's a possibility. And then it just didn't go away. It just kept getting worse. (laughs) By the time I got to my end of year show, I was absolutely exhausted. A few people in my group noticed it. I was very good at hiding it, especially over all of these years. I was really good at hiding it. Uh, And it got to a point where I just, (laughs) I couldn't hide it anymore. So yeah, it was bad. (laughs) You couldn't hide it anymore. No. Wow. How were you hiding it? I don't even know. I just think I'm one of those people who, well, I used to be one of those people who, if I was feeling really upset about things, if I was feeling really down, I sort of had that dancer mentality where it's just like, that's a you problem. So you've got to sort it out. If you are feeling upset about things, you know, talk to people about it where you can, but pain and stuff like that, you've just got to kind of push through. And there were times where I couldn't, but I would just mask it as, oh, I didn't sleep very well. I'm feeling just a little bit tired, but it was so much more than that. So now it's at the end of the year. And when does your body give out now? 
so I actually went on holiday at the end of 2018 I'd planned it with my then partner for all year and I was like this is going to be my break where I can just relax my body we went to Bali and I just felt awful I was feeling dizzy and faint and fatigued and just not good and it got to a point where I actually ended up passing out in a restaurant um ended up in a random hospital over there on a drip and they were like yeah we don't really know what's wrong other than a bit dehydrated go and check it out when you get back and I just remember coming back through the airport and my mum picked us up and she just looked at me and she just burst into tears because I was just like a complete wreck she said all the color was gone from your face you look gaunt and just like dead in the eyes and I tried to go back to the uni at the beginning of that year and I couldn't even stay awake to rehearse let alone move my body properly I was having trouble opening a water bottle (laughs) that's how bad it got Um, I was having trouble driving doing anything so I just had to drop out because it was meant to be my honours year and I just said no I can't do it I really wanted to do honours, but I just, I didn't have the strength in me. So I thought I'm just going to graduate with my bachelor with my head held high and just go and take care of me. Cause obviously it's something really bad going on and that's where it really started. Yeah. So you couldn't undo your own water bottle. No. So for the first year in our previous chat, you said you were mostly bed bound and couch bound. So can you describe your functionality level and also your main symptoms. I know you had said that you had symptoms popping up for five years, but what were your main symptoms now? It's funny, actually. I spoke to mom about this the other day because a lot of the first half of that year, I'd actually mentally blocked out. So I couldn't even remember how bad I was. And I thought, oh, maybe I was bad, but not that bad. And mom was like, no, I was spoon feeding you and showering you and helping you get changed because walking to the bathroom was just exhausting. Lifting my arms was exhausting. Turning over in bed was exhausting. Everything was just like so heavy and achy and fatiguing. It basically felt like having glanche all over again, but severe. Um, So my glands were up. I was achy, tired, hot flushes, headaches, dizziness all those horrible flu symptoms and then horrible brain fog as well. I was forgetting words, couldn't speak properly, couldn't string full sentences. So I just felt completely incapacitated and just not really functioning well at all. Yeah, it's like that day one of the flu feeling. I know exactly what you mean. Absolutely. And you know that you need to rest and you know that that's the best way to look after yourself. But it's one of those horrible things where you know that it might not be better in five days like the flu. It will be something that keeps going. Yeah, that must have been really difficult because how old were you at that time? Goodness, I'm 25 now, 23, I think, 22. Your friends are probably out drinking and partying. Yeah, can you share how that might have been a challenge? It was really hard and watching the rest of my honours class just still doing their shows and rehearsing and getting to fly to a different state to, you know, meet directors and everything. It was really hard. And I saw a few friends step away as well. Um, some that just really didn't understand or only saw me on my good day. So they assumed that I was okay, but no one, I don't think ever really saw my bad days because I wasn't even well enough to pick up the phone to video chat anyone. So I didn't really want anyone to see that, but yeah, it was really hard watching people live their life and kind of going, well, I used to be like that. So what's going on with me? And I was actually really scared at first that it was something like maybe cancer or something really severe because you just don't know and going from standing and being able to dance and do everything every day to being in your bed and on the couch you're like well there has to be some explanation behind this but I couldn't find anything so it was hard. So you couldn't find an explanation you probably hadn't heard of chronic fatigue syndrome before 
your friend had been like, oh, it might be post-viral fatigue and you'll get yeah. better in a couple of weeks. So can you describe your early experience with doctors and seeking answers? Yeah, well, luckily enough, my mum is a nurse. So she had spoken to a few people that she worked with and chronic fatigue syndrome got thrown around a little bit and she was like, hmm, I'm going to do some more research on that. Um, some of the doctors that she worked with were really they didn't believe it and they were like no nah, it's just a thing people use and they can't find anything else wrong with them and I was like well that's nice um that's what my doctor told me as yeah well. what's with that <laughs> gosh and it's like okay that's really invalidating thank you so much and I had gone across a couple of different medical centers because I moved in that time moved back into my parents house and the first doctor I'd seen thought it was uh, depression and maybe some PTSD from what I'd been through in Bali. So he stuck me on antidepressants, which landed me at the doctors anyway, because I ended up having a massive reaction to them because I didn't need them. Interesting. Yeah. So they just thought it was depression. Yeah. They were like, oh, are you feeling really sluggish and you're tired and you got this and that sounds like depression. Have some of these. So what medication did they give you? And you said you had a reaction to it. Yeah, it was citalopram, which is an SSRI. It's one of the generic antidepressants they usually go for first. And I had a reaction to it. They called it serotonin syndrome, which is where your body basically rejects the serotonin because your body just doesn't want it it doesn't want that synthetic antidepressant I'm not a scientist so this is probably completely wrong um but if you look up serotonin syndrome it gives you tremors and shakes and hot flushes and nausea and all this horrible stuff which sometimes people think is the normal symptoms to starting antidepressants which I thought it was at first but it just kept getting worse and worse and as soon as I stopped them it took a good week to recover from it so yeah, that wasn't a great start. <laughs> so did the doctors then validate this and be like, okay, you're not depressed now? Yeah, well, I moved doctors in that time and it was the new doctors that saw my reaction to that. And I got switched over to a lovely doctor. He's amazing. Um, he did all my paperwork for uni and everything. And he went, yep, this is chronic fatigue syndrome and explained it to me and how it works. And he was like, we're going to try and get a plan together for you. You know, there's a physiotherapy here. There's exercise physiology here. There's a few different ways we can go about this. So he was really, really informative and gave me a bit more hope. So I think it just takes that one doctor that really wants to listen. Yeah, that's so true. When we have that one doctor who validates us, but also gives us hope and a plan. So you did mention physiotherapy, but at this point yeah. you were not in any shape to do any sort of exercise. I mean, you're struggling to lift your arm. Yeah, basically I started going to the physiotherapies physiotherapist I can't speak just to sort of try and help with those aches and pains and I just don't think my body was ready for it we tried doing hydrotherapy um, I tried doing a bit of exercise physiology and I would crash every time because as you know post-exertional malaise is a huge part of chronic fatigue syndrome so I would just yeah feel absolutely exhausted for weeks afterwards and I find it really hard to get back in there knowing that I would feel like that again afterwards so I just thought, okay, this is going to have to be something that I do maybe in a couple of years. This isn't something I can do right now because I just, I don't have the strength for it. That's really powerful. You listening to your body and respecting that versus trying to achieve and push through. And I imagine yeah. it was probably even hard just to get in the car to go to these places. <laughs> Oh, it's so hard. I just remember crying all the time going into the car and being like, I know I'm going to feel awful afterwards, but this has to be good for me. And it just got to a point where I was like, I can't keep getting in the car knowing that I'm going to come back. I'm going to need to go to bed for like two weeks. I just, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. But that's interesting because you were optimistic about it, but then you had to face your reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and my body was like not now you need to rest so I thought okay we're just gonna have to do it yeah and what did rest look like for you was it resting physically was it resting mentally can you kind of paint the picture for me it was just sort of yeah like resting both physically and mentally where I just let my body be in the state that it was as uncomfortable as it was I just had to go 
okay, if I need to lay in bed all day and just let my body sink into the bed, that's what I'm going to have to do. There's no point pushing it. You know, there's no point trying to force myself to do things if I don't feel like it. I have a good support base here. And, you know, if I felt like I could maybe do something a little bit, I would try it. But most of the time it was just, I need to actually be okay with relying on other people right now and delegating tasks because there's no way I can stand up and help with the dishes or, you know, go out and help with the gardening or anything. But (laughs) maybe I can sit outside today instead and actually get some fresh air whilst mum and dad are working outside in the garden. Maybe I can change where I'm sitting today just so it's a little bit more comfortable. But I was actually okay with stopping because I knew that, you know, I couldn't really do anything else. And so I felt, it sounds horrible, but I didn't feel guilty about resting. Wow. That's powerful. So you decided I'm not going to feel guilty about resting. Yeah. I obviously, I need it and we're just going to have to wait this out and go from there, which was a mentality I kind of kept for a while especially when I started getting better and I was like I probably should do more but I was a little bit like but maybe you should rest and yeah it was just finding that balance and for me honestly it was most days like okay I'm just gonna nap most of the day some days I could then start watching a little bit of tv or a movie so then I would try and watch a movie that was funny or reminded me of my childhood like really uplifting things you decided I'm going to watch things that bring me joy versus, you know, a scary movie. Yeah, absolutely. Although when I was watching things, I was like, I wonder what it would feel like to be able to feel that healthy and go for a run. Like this person's doing in the movie. And I was like, okay, change movie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't watch that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. But I also love what you said earlier about, you know, changing where you're sitting. Maybe I'm going to try to sit outside today. Yeah. Yeah, change the scenery a bit because it can get a bit, yeah, it can get a bit boring when you're sat in the one spot for six to eight months. And I know people have gone through this for years, so it's definitely tricky. So how did you deal with mental overstimulation and screen time and social media? Yeah, (laughs) it was one of those things where some days I could look at my phone and sort of be on social media or watch a movie. And then some days I couldn't look at a screen because it just hurt my eyes too much in my head and just made me feel horrible. So it was very much a thing of just feeling out how you go with it each day and trying not to spend too much time just scrolling like mindlessly. I was like, I need to find other accounts on here where I feel I can relate or are informative, even some positive ones as well. And I just tried to find more meaningful things that I could do on social media which is why I created the Instagram blog that I did but yeah I tried not to be sitting there like (laughs) the whole time because I just felt horrible afterwards. Yeah so did you ever see a functional medicine doctor at any point to do more thorough lab work or a naturopath? I did. Yeah. I have a little sort of like family. I call them now the holistic practitioners that really helped who sort of work together. And I still see them like for acupuncture tune-ups and everything when I feel like it. So I started off with acupuncture. We tried everything and it got to the point where mum was like, you know what, let's just try something completely different. Let's go and try acupuncture. And I'll just say quickly as well, that first session, I was barely able to walk in. I can't even remember where he put the needles. He just sort of went everywhere. And it was like an hour session. And then I walked out of that session. We walked down the road and had a cup of tea on the corner. And I suddenly had this energy out of nowhere. And I was like, I think this is what I need to keep doing. Even though the next day I felt horrible and like I was hit by a bus, which apparently is very normal for starting acupuncture treatment. But yeah, that was definitely one that I started off with. So I didn't see an integrative doctor for a while. It was more towards the beginning to middle of last year, actually. I was more focused on acupuncture and naturopath, which did help, but there was something missing, which is when the integrative doctor sort of Mm -hmm. stepped in. So there's one main integrative doctor in my state and she did some deeper blood tests and went blood work. This is what you've got. I've seen this before. I'm treating people with chronic fatigue syndrome and POTS. I believe I can help you. And that was like, wow like the sun came out yeah (laughs) so what did she find in your blood work so it turns out that I had severely low levels of zinc and really high copper so she explained it that it's not 
heavy metal poisoning issue it's that everyone has sort of a balance of two different nutrients like there's quite a few of them in your body and zinc and copper are usually the culprit especially for women because zinc gets depleted very easily for us especially due to high stress illness contraception there's so many different factors And so what had happened is my copper level had taken over and gone sky high and my zinc level had dropped really, really low. It wasn't anything that I'd heard of before. So I was a little bit skeptical at first because I was like, well, if no one's picked up on this zinc deficiency, then, you know, where are we pulling this from? But my goodness, she was right because she gave me this zinc supplementation. It had like magnesium and a few other bits and pieces in it, but it was just a slightly stronger zinc than what you would get over the chemist. I started taking that and started seeing improvements literally within weeks. It was crazy. Um, Although she said, when you're dumping the copper out of your systems, you will probably feel a bit off, like you're detoxing a bit. And that part was a bit hard because there were times where I really just did not feel good. But overall, I was getting my energy back in tenfold with the zinc treatment. And then also she upped my magnesium as well, which really helped the aches and pains in the pots and b12 for my brain fog because that was a little bit low and just overall just as the months started gradually going I just started seeing more and more improvements oh wow yeah and I know magnesium is one too for pain and because it helps us with so many functions in our body for our neurotransmitters yeah and our muscle contractions Yeah. And she said, apparently like what you normally get saying like the pharmacy is probably not nearly enough what a lot of us need. And I think she was saying a lot of people, especially in South Australia are magnesium deficient, but no one really picks it up, but they go, Oh, I'm having all these aches and pains and cramps and all this sort of stuff. And then realize they actually need a lot of magnesium. So I'm on magnesium glycinate, which is a specific type. And I was taking two capsules a day. I still do because it really, really helps and it's good for your system. And yeah, there's quite a bit of magnesium in there, but I've definitely felt better taking that. So yeah, that was a huge one. Yeah, I actually took magnesium glycinate and I still take it. Um, I think it's longer lasting. Magnesium oxide is the one that draws water to your colon. So that can be helpful for digestion. Absolutely. So I took both of those. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. glycinate, good stuff. Yeah. (laughs) There just must be, yeah, there's something in it. Cause I've also noticed, even if I'm a bit sore from a workout or something like that, I take one of those capsules and literally all of it goes away. It's really strange. Like your body just sucks it up. It loves it. (laughs) Yeah. And it's so true what you said. A lot of people are deficient and it's because magnesium is being depleted from our soil. So yeah, probably a hundred years ago, there weren't as many magnesium deficiencies, but we also have a lot of stress in our lives these days. That's it. And uh, vitamin D and the magnesium go hand in hand as well, Mm -hmm. which can affect the absorption too. So I was also vitamin D deficient and the vitamin D capsules that I got from down the road just weren't cutting it. So I had to go on some really special ones for a little while just to really boost it and I notice a difference with that as well so I think with functional doctors and integrative practitioners they often have better access to quality vitamins and nutritional supplements and I've just found that they have served me a lot better because what you get in say like a multivitamin is just a very minuscule amount of that vitamin so having it pure and by itself you know has really helped yeah pure too without all the fillers yeah that's it and what did the naturopath you previously mentioned help you with if anything we were looking at working on my adrenals sort of going hand in hand with the acupuncture and just some really gentle energy boosters things that were good for my gut we were just looking at overall just maintaining what the acupuncture was doing we did look into mold toxicity and mold illness because when I did have glands I was living in a flat that did have a lot of mold but my mold tests came back negative so we sort of went okay well maybe that's not it then so I do want to touch base again about the mold Yeah. So mold and mono, I had a flu that triggered a reactivation of a past monovirus and I was living in mold. 
But yeah, the test, if you're not living in mold anymore, it's not going to come back <laughs> to show what happened two yeah. years ago. <laughs> exactly. It was one of those things where I was just like, I'm going to try every test possible that I can afford until I can't afford anything. And then I'm just going to see what I can do from there. So not all mold is black and green and scary looking. There are a lot of mold species that just grow on dust. But if you're living in a dry place, there's no leaks, there's lots of sunlight, there's good ventilation, it's less of a chance it's going to be that. Yeah, because I was wondering whether your body held on to it for a while. You know, I wasn't really sure about that. I'd been living in that flat for a few years, but I'd also taken stuff with me from that flat, which I think oh. the um, National Council were a bit worried about. Yeah, so I did throw a few things out because they were looking a bit, you know... <laughs> Like some old sweaters or some old papers. Yeah, and books and stuff as well, like yeah. some old textbooks that were just looking a bit funky. So, um, yeah, we were like, maybe I should get rid of those. But I moved, like my parents' house is fairly new. It's light and dry and airy. So I'm really glad that we did look into that and try and rule everything out because, yeah, my naturopath really helped eliminate everything and then we could go from there. Yeah, yeah and that's interesting that you did bring stuff over and then you threw stuff out. I threw out everything and I wish I had held on to some stuff for future, you know, I did the neuroplasticity stuff and brain rewiring stuff as part of my journey. So yes. I wish I would have held on to a couple things. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it was hard then to, you know, rewire my reaction to it. <laughs> yeah. So I could yeah. live in society again when I had completely eliminated everything. So yeah. All right. So this is so good. This is very comprehensive. We're going through a lot of stuff. So let's talk about the POTS, postural orthostatic intolerance center. POTS. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about your experience with that and what helped there? You told me a couple of things in our previous chat, but let's get into that. Yeah. POTS was the really scary one. That was the one that really came along and just blew everything out of the water. I literally woke up one day. It was like halfway into that sort of chronic fatigue journey. I just woke up one day and my heart, I could feel palpitations and I was really uncomfortable and my heartbeat was racing and I had an Apple watch on and I was sitting down and it showed my heart rate was over a hundred. So I was like, hmm, that's really weird. And I stood up to go to the bathroom and my heart rate was like 140, 150 and I'm going what's going on I must just be unwell or getting something again so that whole week I sort of just kept a monitor on it and it just kept doing it like every time I was standing up and I'd start feeling really dizzy a bit faint and I was like oh no I don't know what this is and I don't want something else and I'd seen a few people had mentioned on my blog about having POTS and I was like I, I wonder if this is a possibility because it can be a comorbidity I think that's how you say it, with things like chronic fatigue syndrome, especially if you've been deconditioned, there's a whole host of reasons. And I approached mum about it and I said, this is what my heart rate's doing. This isn't normal. Because then she measured it on her wrist and she stood up and her heart rate was like 65 and mine was like 170. And she was like, yeah, that's definitely not normal. So there's something we're going to have to look into. Um, and yeah, then I started passing out every time I was standing up and like my legs just collapsing and my heart rate just kept climbing. Unless I sat down, it would just keep going. So it would go 120, 140, 170, 200. And I was like, okay, yeah, I should probably sit down or I'm going to faint. So that made the whole situation a lot harder because I was trying to sort of get my independence back. And then that just kicked me down again, um, and made me too scared to even stand up. I can imagine. Did you get any tests or diagnosis or did you just, you know, read online? Can you talk about what you did? I did at first read it online. And I was just sort of seeing people sharing their stories and I was like, this is actually extremely common. So I went and approached my doctor about it and he was all for it. He said, you know, that's not something that I've treated before. I've heard of it. Um, but, you know, that's something that we can maybe look into. I think I was going back to the doctors actually to get a referral to get a tilt table test. 
and that specific day I was feeling really really unwell my dad was with me as well and I think it really shocked him poor guy because at my doctors you've got the main doctor area and then you've got the treatment room with some nurses at the back so say if you fall over and cut yourself you can just go straight to the treatment room and I started feeling a bit dizzy and faint and just shaky and not well so I went straight to the treatment room to lie down on one of the beds whilst I waited for the doctor to come out and get me he came to get me and I stood up and I just passed out basically in dad's arms and he was like oh my goodness what's going on so they got me sat down my blood pressure I think laying down had been pretty normal it was like 120 over I can't even remember it was just it was a normal blood pressure reading I stood up and my blood pressure went to 80 over 60 and my heart rate was 195 Uh, and they were like okay, you need to lay down. So they laid me down. As soon as I laid down, my heart rate was back to 65. So that's a huge, huge jump. And I remember it was actually kind of funny considering the circumstances, but the doctor just went, okay, I'm going to get an emergency referral and we're going to get you to a tilt table test as soon as we can. That's definitely POTS. And then just sort of walked out and I was like, that's not really the way I wanted the diagnosis, but okay, (laughs) I guess that's it. So yeah, I did end up going to hospital that day as well because because my heart rate was going so fast, it was causing a lot of chest pain. And it was written off as costochondritis. Um, it's another sort of generic diagnosis where it's just chest pain. I think that's literally what it translates to, chest pain. And I was like, yeah, but when I stand up, I feel faint and my heart rate goes really high. And they're like, no, it's costochondritis. Just go home and rest. Here's some Panadol Osteo. Yeah, go and chill out. And, you know, obviously chest pain and stuff is a part of POTS because your heart rate is going so fast, it would hurt your chest. Yeah, and I think all of this is a type of dysautonomia. Is that another word that's used? Yeah, it's under that branch of dysautonomia, yeah. Yeah, where your neurological system, which I think controls your heart rate, Mm -hmm. it's all haywire. Yeah. So what are some things you then did to treat your POTS? Uh, So in the beginning, it was compression socks, electrolytes, extra salt on my food, medication. They didn't really offer it to me because I already had low blood pressure. I always have since I was a kid. So they were like, well, if we give you this medication to lower your heart rate, then your blood pressure will also drop. So you'll probably pass out more, which then means we need to give you another medication to counteract that and another medication to counteract that. And I was like, no, I can't do that. So I assume the medication was a beta blocker that they wanted to give you? Yeah, and there was also fludrocortisone, which they suggested, which is to help hold the salt and water, I think, in your kidneys and, and stops that blood pooling, which is another thing with POTS, like your feet and legs and everything go really red and purple from standing because all the blood just goes like straight to your feet and legs. So yeah, that was something that they did talk about, but I was also really put off medications from the antidepressant that I'd had. So I was like, I will just try my best to do this the natural way. And that was, that was a hard journey. And I did find that I also had to get back into exercise physiology because with POTS exercise is one of the best things for it no matter how horrendous you feel unfortunately exercise is something that you do have to do with POTS at some stage. So it's kind of a catch-22 situation now and you have to figure out this balance because there are the symptoms just with POTS if you overdo it physically but there's also that post-exertional malaise with Mm -hmm. CFS that's the one that was the big one yeah but you now have been resting a lot taking it easy so when did you get to the point where you were able to incorporate I shouldn't even say exercise maybe increasing your physical activity yeah it wasn't too long after the POTS diagnosis when I reached out to the exercise physiologist that I had seen at the start and I just said, look, I've also been diagnosed with POTS. I know that exercise is something that's meant to help or something that I need to start doing, but I also have chronic fatigue syndrome, so I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I was really like, I really don't know how I'm going to do this. And she said, all right, well, we'll start with a home visit. She came over and saw me and just gave me some really gentle exercise to start doing on my yoga mat, lying on my back, and it was just stuff to move my legs and move my arms and try and strengthen my core 
And she said, if you can walk a little bit, even for like five minutes, like down the road, even end of your driveway and come back up, just try and do it. Just something gentle. And then just do this exercise maybe every other day. Then we'll start doing it every day and go from there. And at first it was really, really hard. I felt like I was crashing a lot, not as much as I would have been when I was bedridden. Cause at this point I was more on the couch and able to do a little bit more. But yeah, trying to do walking and doing the exercise physiology at the same time was a bit too hard. So for me, it was one or the other. So I said, okay, well, today I might go for a five minute walk. Tomorrow I'll do my mat based Pilates exercises. And that was sort of my program for a couple of months. Yeah, I love that because you were listening to your body and you were like, okay, my body is saying (laughs) this might be a little much. So I'm going to pick one. The five minute walk or the floor exercise, the gentle floor stretch. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, both is not happening. And I sort of carried on with this. And then obviously when I started the integrative doctor midway through that point and started taking the zinc, I noticed I have more energy anyway. And the chronic fatigue was starting to tone it down a bit. So then I was able to do a bit more. And then I started getting less scared of having a little bit of a crash because they weren't as bad as what they were before I would maybe just want to have like a nap for a couple of days and stuff but it wouldn't be like stuck in bed can't move so that gave me a bit more confidence to do more and then I actually ended up going to the exercise physiology clinic and then we started doing a little bit of recumbent bike and just in a recline position she had a blood pressure cuff and a little um, heart monitor on my finger and we were just measuring that the whole time I was doing a little bit of a cycle for about five ten minutes She'd give me some more strength exercises that I could do seated with some dumbbells. And it was just months and months of building, building, building slowly on that until we got to about last year, which is when I started to really start building on what I was doing. Wow. So this was months and months and months and months. And I like how you're explaining how gradual and yeah, it's so gradual. <laughs> I don't want to say easy because it wasn't easy for you at the time, but now <laughs> no, looking back, it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was so painfully gradual, but I knew it was just, I had to just trust the process and just seeing the results of me actually having more stamina to cope with those crashes as well really made the difference to me because I was like, oh, I'm tired today. I feel like I'm going to need a nap, but I don't feel like I'm dying. So we're off to a good start, (laughs) which you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So halfway through 2020, is this when you start to do some real exercise? Yeah, slowly started to do that. And a lot of things had changed in my life around that time as well. So I met my now partner who is just amazing. Um, And he's someone who's very outdoorsy and loves going for walks and camping and that sort of thing. And sort of helped me come out my shell a bit because I obviously with everything I've been through with POTS and chronic fatigue, I had awful anxiety, like awful anxiety. And I was having panic attacks a lot and leaving the house was really quite scary for me, even though I would do it. I was scared that I would maybe faint in public or I'd feel unwell in public and be trapped and I couldn't go anywhere. So it made me quite agoraphobic. So when I started dating him, I started coming out of my shell a bit and being able to do things that I didn't think I could do. And then all of a sudden we were going on walks in nature and seeing the local waterfalls and just going for little walks and just starting really slow. And I was super puffed in the beginning and super unfit, but he knew where I was at. He knew I was still recovering and he sort of just met me there and just kind of guided me along, which is just, Oh, that's yeah. amazing. he sounds awesome. Yeah. He and, is, yeah. yeah. And my now husband, <laughs> who's my boyfriend at the time, was yeah. very supportive. It's just like, okay, we're going to go to the street corner and you yeah, know, yeah. Put on the bed. So sweet. But yeah, it's yeah, really sweet. It is nice to be with someone and then just to be able to enjoy whatever you can do together and not have yeah. someone trying to push you to keep going, but just meet you where mm-hmm. you are. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not someone who wanted to rely on someone else for my healing. I was very much like I have to do the work by myself, but he sort of just made me feel like I wanted to try more and also not even from saying you know you have to do this you have to come with me he'd be like how would you feel if we tried maybe doing this today and I was like you know what that actually sounds nice let's do it 
I started gaining a lot of my independence back that way as well. So I have a lot to be grateful for with him. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he's definitely one of the healing factors, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A nice cute boyfriend who's supportive. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to look back through my notes here. I did write something about if you're healthy and you've never been through this, it's hard to have empathy. Was it about your friends or was it about people in general? Or There was a few people in general. I mean, I'd been through a fair bit of emotional stuff with people in my life as well. I'd suffered through some emotional abuse from a partner, which at the time I thought, you know, maybe it's just like, this is normal, but it wasn't. And some friends just not understanding. Um, And it's not until I came out of that, that I went, they didn't understand because they don't know what it's like to be in my body, but they're also unable to see or accept that this is what I'm going through. Um, Which... I think it can be a tough one because I know when I started becoming really unwell, it was really hard for mum and dad to accept and see that this is what's happening. But they sort of went with me through that journey and they were like, I don't understand what it feels like to be in your body, but we're going to try our best to be there to support you and listen to you. And that's, that's all I really wanted from, you know, anybody that was in my life. And so It's one of those things where if you haven't been through a condition like this, you're not going to fully understand what it's like. You may have empathy, but you won't, you won't understand like fatigue and the pain that we go through and the emotional pain that we go through. It's a whole other level. And yeah, unless you've been through it, you just, (laughs) you're not going to understand what it's like. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's also learning to accept that too. Because I remember for myself, I tried to like explain it to people and (laughs) yeah. And there's some people who just aren't going to get it. No. And they kind of go, oh, well, maybe it's like temporary, you know, maybe you'll get better soon. And it's like, well, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I just really wish you'd be there to support me however long it takes you know, the best way I describe it to someone as well as I'd say it's like having the flu, but really bad. And they would be like, well, yeah, but I don't remember what it feels like because I get over the flu in like five or six days. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm not getting over it. That's the difference. Yeah. It's funny though, because like when you do have people who have the flu, they're the biggest babies and you're like, okay, remember this, how you feel right now. And then yeah. for three years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's just never ending. Yeah. But I mean, we ourselves had hope and just were like, oh, it'll go away in a couple of weeks. It'll go in a couple of weeks later. And then it's not like we're giving up. It's not like we're saying this is going to happen to me for life, but it's accepting that reality. We're not just going to get well soon. It's a whole process healing from this. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's multifaceted as well, because there's so many reasons that contributed, you know, it's often not just one reason, but I got glands and I got flu and that's what it was. There's like everything else that's going on at the time that just affects you when you go, oh my gosh, there was this and there was that and there was this. So when I get better, I need to work on how I handle this or emotionally how I look after myself. And you just really find out over time that there was so much more contributing (laughs) to it. Yes, because I look yeah. back and I'm like, okay, I would have initially said, okay, it was the flu, it was the mono reactivation. Then I later found out yeah. it's a mold. But then I also find out other things. And when you hear other people's stories too, like I really yeah. didn't have good boundaries in my life. I wasn't <laughs> in alignment for me with my purpose. And there's a lot of things going on too. And then some. Yeah also ways I just handled situations that were causing stress. Yeah. We were very different people back then, I think. Yeah. I mean, we're still ourselves, but just, you know, improved versions or transformed. (laughs) Caitlin (laughs) 2.0. Yeah. This is such good stuff. So we didn't talk about diet. So did you work with the integrative doctor or the naturopath or the acupuncturist on diet and did you try different diets and did any help you 
Yeah, uh, we tried a few. I mean, most of it was from the acupuncturist, from the Chinese medicine perspective. He was like, I want you to have more warm foods, ones that easily digest. Because I was I was looking at maybe going like more plant-based and he was like, don't do that. Because I was like, I still am a bit lower on the iron side. So he was like, you need meats and warm foods that you can digest easy. And I also did switch over to doing a little bit of a lower carb based diet, which I still try to follow. So I have more natural foods that are from the earth. I think for most people, it's sort of closer to paleo. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of root veggies, lots of grass fed meat and trying to limit processed grains, processed sugars, that sort of thing. But I've more stuck with the Chinese medicine side of things. And I found that has really helped. There's definitely something in that where it's you having warm foods all the time. So I have, you know, a warm breakfast and a warm lunch. Like I'll take my soups and my broths to work and all that sort of thing. And I still carry it on. And then dinner will just be so many different colors of vegetables with some meat. And that's where I feel most energetic and my body digested a lot easier. Because I did try having like, say, snacking on nuts a lot and crackers and stuff and then I was just having really weird digestive issues with that throughout the chronic fatigue situation I didn't have anything like severe nausea or anything like that luckily but I'd still react really bad to even like gluten things like things I just wouldn't react to I reacted to so um, I tried a lot of things (laughs) but you know just Chinese medicine and paleo sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's actually was very similar to me too. I had an acupuncturist and she was like, eat warm for your spleen because she found some, I don't know what she did, but I do know people who do go plant-based. Sometimes people do paleo for a few years and then their bodies get tired of it and then they make a transition. So it's always interesting because we're all different, but our bodies can also change themselves over time. So yeah, absolutely. And they can adapt and adjust as well. And they'll kind of go, I'm sick of this. You need to try something else. And I did uh, try a bit more keto based for a while as well. I'll probably get a lot of stick for it because I do enjoy keto. I think it worked really well for me and it gave me some energy. Might not be something I can do forever, but I do still kind of go lower carb because for whatever reason, my body was just able to do when I wasn't having so many heavy carbs in my stomach. So I stuck with that and that really helped. So, but yet the paleo one has been a highlight throughout for sure. Well, keto is just lowering your carbs. The paleo is just more meat and more protein. More yeah. protein. Yeah. And when I found I, I did that, I was fuller for longer, having less blood sugar drops as well, which is a very common thing that can happen with like chronic fatigue and stuff because your um, nervous system is just so highly strung. You'll just find it goes like that. So it was a way yeah. of keeping steady as well. Yeah, a diet to help keep the blood sugar level stable. And it all feeds off one another. (laughs) But yeah, I do know some people who they found carbs better to keep their blood sugar stable or they had problems digesting the fat. So it's like we have to find out that balance and it's just through trial and error. Again, it's so individual, isn't it? Which is just a hard thing with it. Like a doctor can't sit down and go, okay, you need to do this much exercise you need to eat this specific way and you need to do this because then for the next person, they'll be like, well, I feel horrible doing this, you know? And then that's when you go, oh, well, I have to try and make something different again for them. Yeah. But I love how you use your doctors and your physiotherapists as guides, but you ultimately were the one calling the shots to tailor it for what was right for you. Yeah. You definitely at some stage in a journey like this have to take full control of your own personal healthcare journey because at the end of the day it's it's like what I said before with the doctors and everything they'll say you need to try this and try that but you know how you feel so you have to sort of go okay well what's my gut telling me is this right for me yeah you do and sometimes you know you can (laughs) question your gut I mean there is that anxiety too because Mm -hmm. you have all these symptoms and you're like okay should I do this or should I do that? And you really wonder sometimes in the beginning, I was like, am I making the right decision on this supplement? 
Am I making the right decision if I should do this? When you don't know what's going to happen, it's kind of scary. No, and then when you're also trying holistic things as well, it's a bit like I haven't been in this territory before, so I really don't know how this is going to go or what I'm doing. But then when you actually find what works for you, you go, oh my goodness, I've got to stick with it. Yeah, and then you find what works. Yes. And then you begin to trust yourself more. So yeah, and... Do you, did you do anything to get into a good circadian rhythm? Was insomnia something for you or was that not an issue? It wasn't a huge issue, but it definitely was like, obviously if you're sleeping all day, then you find it really hard to switch off at night as well. And I would also find I was more awake at nighttime. So one of the first things my naturopath brought up was getting morning light so opening my blinds so that when I woke up in the morning, I didn't have a choice but to wake up because the light would just be like, like streaming through um, and trying and maybe having my first cup of tea, like sat outside if it was a nice day and getting that light on me as well. And just sort of sticking to a bit of a routine, which was also spoken about in the ANS Rewire program as oh, well. Oh, we didn't so, talk about the ANS yeah, Rewire. I just kind of forgot about that too. That was the big one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ANS Rewire. I actually did it midway through my journey, but I didn't get through all the videos. And then I found DNRS and stuck with DNRS. But yeah. you found ANS Rewire, which is Dan Newfer's program, helpful for you. Can you share what was your favorite parts about the ANS Rewire? It's a neuroplasticity program and also a holistic program for CFS. I love how informative it was. It wasn't just, we're going to go straight into how you start rewiring your brain. It was, we're going to get all your base levels fixed in terms of, we're going to look at your sleep. We're going to look at your nutrition. He sort of talked about the blood sugars and everything and how that works. We're going to look at your like exercise, if you can, mindset, and then we're going to go into the rewiring. So it was very, very comprehensive. And he's got a lot of research and a lot of scientific evidence backed up into it, which made me feel very comfortable with it. And I'd been looking up a lot about the rewiring as well and like DNRS, because I've seen like a few of my other friends have recovered from that as well. And I was like, oh gosh, this is so exciting. Why didn't I consider this before? (laughs) And yeah, I just found it to be really comprehensive. Yeah. So when did you discover this program? You initially got sick in 2017, 2018. When did you discover this? Last year. Okay. So after starting the program, that was what I think pulled me into full recovery. Everything else was sort of happening gradually, but doing the rewiring is what completely swept everything off the table it was like this is what is going to make you better now because you've got all the other tools in place yeah and I think it's so key to have that foundation in place too yeah it's so helpful and it just came at the right time for you so it was yeah I think divine timing and all of that definitely (laughs) yeah so you do mention that he did say exercise if you can but he's not saying I mean he had severe CFS he had that and POTS and fibromyalgia I think as well so can you describe a little bit about what the take on exercise is with that program he sort of mostly spoke about how you change your mindset towards exercise so it doesn't need to be I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to lift a ton of weights and I'm going to you know start sprinting on the treadmill or like forcing myself to do something it was doing it because it feels good and gentle and sort of telling yourself in a way that doing exercise is good for your body it's good for your lymphatic system and just for your overall body and your nervous system it's really good for calming it down and telling your body that you doing exercise isn't going to make you feel bad long run it's going to help so it was sort of changing the mindset towards it which was really good and what you describe is such a nuance because you're saying it's not pushing yourself it's not thinking optimistically i'm just going to push myself through rocky no. this it's i'm going to do this gently when it feels good and it's going to Yeah, so he was like, find something that feels good to you, whether it's doing some stretching or even lifting a couple of weights. He said, if it starts to feel really bad, just stop and tell yourself what I've done is good for me and that's where I'm going to stop. He said things like swimming, going for a walk outside, getting into nature, just things that are really grounding and gentle on the body. 
none of this I need to like power lift 50 kilos all of a sudden um yeah and just changing your mindset towards it which I think was really really interesting yeah I really appreciate that and you explain it really well and because it's so nuanced (laughs) yeah so now I mean he does have the rewire rounds can you describe it a little without giving away his copyrighted program but just (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) um I want to know The best way to describe it, because obviously when you are feeling unwell, you are focused a lot on your symptoms and how you're feeling in your body. So it was changing the way you think about how you feel in your body. So if a symptom pops up, how you feel about that symptom and how you're going to sort of like let it go. That probably sounds bad, but it's hard to explain without (laughs) saying the exact words. Yeah, Um, the rewire. It's changing your relationship to how you view symptoms and pain. Yeah, because it's not like we're creating these symptoms in our mind, but what it's addressing in ANS rewire is getting rid of that additional stress response to those symptoms. Yeah which drive the symptoms. And it's all explains the science, how our stress response to these very real symptoms can actually not be supportive of healing. Exactly. Yeah. And it's changing the way that you've experienced symptoms before in your past, because it is sort of a form of conditioning and changing the way that you'll see them in the future and sort of creating a new brain. And that to me was really interesting. So I was like, how is this going to work? How am I going to notice this is working? But yeah, so at first it was quite hard because you have to pretty much do it for every symptom that you feel. And every time you're thinking about it, you have to start rewiring. So I felt a little bit like I was going crazy in the beginning because I was talking to myself a lot, Um, (laughs) like around the house, like in my head. But I just kept at it. And then when you start to notice, well, before you even realize, you start doing it less and less. And you have little sheets as well that he gives you that you can fill out with your progress on there as well. So you can actually see month by month what the progress is like, you know, where you started and where you're finishing. Yeah. So you found that one helpful. Did you check out any of the others? I didn't. I mean, I was going to if I found the ANS rewire wasn't helping for me, but because it was just working so tremendously well, I was like, I guess I'll just stick with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stick with what's working. And that's great. And, yeah. and I really um, appreciate you breaking that down. And did you do the meditations that came with his program? I did. At first, I was really strict on them. And I was like, yep, I'm going to do this every day. And then I felt myself doing them less and less. <laughs> which he's probably going to watch this. He's going to be like, Caitlin, but yeah, I started doing them not as often because I also felt like I was becoming calmer anyway. So I did switch over because I have headspace on my phone as well. And I really like their meditations too. They've got all the different timings. So I switched over to doing those ones as well. So it just sort of depended yeah. on whether I felt like doing his or a headspace, but as long as I was meditating, it was good. So I still did it most days, but I definitely didn't stick with that for months. (laughs) Yeah, but Headspace, yeah, that was one of them I did myself. And that helped me actually get into meditation because it kind of explains how to meditate. It's an easy way for people who haven't meditated before to kind of learn how to meditate. Yeah, the basics are really, really good as well on there. They just explain things so well and so calming. (laughs) Yeah. So Caitlin, you've been better for, has it been almost a year? Yeah, I think it has because I started the ANS rewire in June, July last year. Uh I was fully recovered from chronic fatigue about November, December last year. And then February, yeah, February is when I fully recovered from POPs. So yeah, it's been like it's getting close to a year. (laughs) That's amazing. I'm so happy for you. How have you changed or transformed from this journey beyond just getting your physical health back? I feel like me again, but different. I feel like I've got my joy and optimism and happiness back, but I feel like someone who is very aware of what their boundaries are, what their limitations are, and that it's okay to step back from things a bit more that sort of perfectionism trait has just died down a little bit and I think because we had to put limitations on ourselves and go you know I can't push through this I can't do this 
it was in the beginning relearning that this is safe to do and you can push this comfort zone a little bit but now I've got solid boundaries where I go if I'm doing this and this and this in the week I have to have a rest day whether it's the middle of the week or it's the Sunday that is my day for me I do what I want to do on that day and if anyone else wants to you know go oh can you do this can you do that can you do this no that's my day (laughs) so I'm just a lot stricter with putting my health first but in a loving way which is good (laughs) I love that yeah Yeah. that's so powerfully stated Caitlin so thank you What have you been able to do now in your life? Just some of the things that are bringing you joy in life and some of the activities you have been able to do that you weren't before. Yeah, well, I got back to work and the really strange thing is that I'm now working at the physio that I started seeing when I was unwell. So I'm now a receptionist and secretary there. So I'm working three days a week, so about 25 hours a week. Absolutely love my job. I'm going to the gym multiple times a week and doing weightlifting, like heavy weights. I go on walks and trips on the weekend with my partner. We can now do like 5K. We're going to try and do a 10K. I haven't done that for a while, but we can do 5K walks now and like hikes. We've gone camping on the weekend. I flew on a plane this year, which was really good timing because most of Australia is in lockdown now. I'm in a state where we're actually okay at the moment, but I was able to fly up to Queensland for a holiday for a week and I felt fine. And I just feel like I've got my life back, but it's more focused around things that I really love and I really want in my life as opposed to doing things that burn me out and make me feel horrible. So it just feels a lot more enriched and optimistic, which is really good. Yeah. And I mean, of course you lost, you lost some good years of your life, but to be able to have that perspective at your young age and to have that perspective on life and having a balanced approach and what really matters and learning how to create that balance is just, (laughs) you're going to carry with you for so many decades to come. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. And what I went through was horrible and it wasn't just horrible for me. It was horrible for my family as well, seeing me go through that, but I wouldn't change it because it's led me to really understand what my true passions are in life now, what I really want to do, which is help others and has also created a life for me where, like you said, I understand more what my body needs and what is best for me now and how to look after myself well. And that's something that I'll carry for the rest of my life. So yeah, Yeah. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. So what is your dream for your life? You're a receptionist now at the physiotherapy place. Do you hope to be a physiotherapist yourself? I've recently got into uni so from next year I'll be studying to be an exercise physiologist so I'm hoping to specialize in complex chronic conditions including chronic fatigue syndrome, POTS, EDS, fibromyalgia and co and I'm just really really excited to start working with people along their journey as well. Well, it's going to be so beneficial because you have been there and you know that it's so nuanced and to be able to, you know, work with each person from someone who's been there versus someone who doesn't really get the condition. That's going to be really helpful. Yeah, I really hope so. And because it's becoming so, so common now, and I've seen, especially like, unfortunately with all the COVID-19 situation as well with long haul COVID and a lot of people getting really sick from that and getting POTS and chronic fatigue syndrome, there's going to be a lot of people that need this type of help. So, you know, movement is something that I love. Movement is something that really helped me. So I, yeah, I really want to help as many people as I can. And you started yourself just like lying on the floor and doing some some little stretches. Rolling to the bathroom and (laughs) yeah, going on my mat on the floor being like, I don't know how I'm going to be walking and doing everything I want to do. And then here we are (laughs) all of a sudden. (laughs) But yeah, it's so funny because it wasn't all of a sudden you explained how gradual it really was. And I think that's one of my takeaways from your journey is how gradual and gentle you were with yourself. But 
Did you see the finish line? Did you see like, okay, I'm starting to get better. I'm sure there were setbacks. <laughs> yeah, it was very non-linear. It was a bit like sometimes I went up like this and then I had a little bit, but it was never like going more backwards. It was always still going towards that goal. And I got to a point last year when I'd started the rewire where I was like, I really am getting better. Like this year could be so different for me. I'm really, really getting better. And then when I got to the end of the year and I wasn't having post-exertional malaise anymore or symptoms, and I just was starting to live without even thinking about it, I was like, oh, oh, we've got there. And it's, it's one of those things when you see the finish line, but then you get there without sort of realizing that you're there. And then it's not like a huge moment, like you thought it was going to be where you're like, oh my God, I've woken up and I feel amazing. It's just one of those things where you're like, oh, I went for a long walk this weekend and I did this and that and this, this week, and I feel absolutely fine. Oh, I'm well now. <laughs> so it was just like a very sort of like random moment where I was like, okay, I better check my progress sheets. And then everything was like no symptoms and yeah I just felt more healthy and yeah it was good it was a good feeling I guess I will now that's so great yeah you said you have a blog where you do share more of your story yeah so that one's on Instagram at Caitlin Michelle Health um it started off just being a community that I wanted to share my story with and find help from others and find inspiration to get better when I actually recovered I found that I'd unlocked a completely different passion of mine and I went oh my goodness I've learned so much on this journey and I really feel like it could help so many people I've kept my whole journey on there from where I started from I've got my ANS rewire update videos as well so people can see where I started and where I finished and I talk through the progress charts and everything so it's all on there. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to leave it because people need to see where I started from and where I've come to, to help with their own journey. I love that, Caitlin. And I love how you're giving back. I just want people to know that with issues like chronic fatigue syndrome, it's obviously not a one size fits all syndrome. And there are so many different ways that you can go about recovery. Not all of them are going to be things where you're having to spend tons of money. A lot of it is within yourself. So I'm just really wanting to be able to share to people that it is possible. And I've seen so many people with different backgrounds and how they started and what caused it. And so many different people have recovered from it. And I just want to give people that hope that you can get your life back and even if you are on that journey you can still experience some really great breakthroughs as well. I love what you say about a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to help we need to tailor it yeah and I'm grateful that you follow me of course yeah yes yeah <laughs> I think I've been following you for a couple of years now and it's just amazing because I watch all of the recovery stories that you post on there and I was like there were so many people that are recovering and it gave me so much hope so thank you <laughs> you're doing you. good work <laughs> yeah and I'm so glad to share your story now <laughs> thank you and the more of us who share our stories and really give each other hope and options to consider you know we ultimately Absolutely. each have to you know, figure Absolutely. out what works for us, but the better. And that's awesome. And thank you for letting me share on here as well, because I've had a few people come through and be like, you know, what helped you recover? You know, what did you do on your journey? And I was like, I'd need to sit down for a good hour because there is a <laughs> lot to cover. So this has basically helped me do that. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. I'm just so grateful, Caitlin, and just Sending you my encouragement for all that you're doing. And this was just all right, amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Take thank care. Thank you, Liz. See you. Bye. Bye.